Hello friends, um, today we will be discussing chapter 10 of class 9 from the text Beehive. Um, this is the chapter called Kathmandu, which has already been um, covered by Dr. Kumar Parag. So I will do the two companion poems, one by William Wordsworth and one by William Shakespeare. My name is Dr. Amit Ranjan and I teach at RIE Bhuvaneshwar. So let us have a look at these poems. The first one is called A Slumber Did My Spirit Seal by William Wordsworth, who is one of the most important romantic poets of the 19th century and, well, one of the greatest poets uh, in history as well. It is um, ironic as well as pertinent that uh, we are do, doing two poems um, which deal with the matter of um, death when we are surrounded by a pandemic um, in the world and suddenly we are aware of the idea of death, especially um, at your age, uh, one does, does not think much about it, but suddenly you're hearing a lot of news and there is a lot of fear. And this is a subject that um, lots of writers and poets have mulled upon for centuries and written um, very interesting, very beautiful poems also on this subject. So let us have a look. A Slumber Did My Spirit Seal by William Wordsworth. William Wordsworth um, is one of the greatest uh, romantic poets, born in 1770, lived up till 1850, um, long life. And here's the poem. A slumber did my spirit seal, I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force, she neither hears nor sees. Rolled around in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. So let us go back to a line by line explanation. Um, as you can see, it's got a sweet, melancholic, somber tone. Um, it's, it's not staccato, it's, it's not furious, it's, it's quiet. Um, and this kind of intonation is called euphony. So you is for anything that's good, phony for Phonetics, sound, so it's uh, euphony in a way is good sound, sweet sound. So despite the fact that it deals with a very somber matter, um, it's, it's couched as a sweet melancholy song. Let's look at it line by line. A slumber did my spirit seal. So the word slumber means sleep. So a sleep was, a sleep sealed my spirit and I had no human fears. So he's talking about a dreamlike state where um, his spirit is sealed by the sleep and therefore he does not have the fears of the outside world of the human life. It's like how you dream and you feel that it's real. It's got multiple meanings, we'll get back to it, but let's see the next two lines first. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. So he's talking about somebody, a beloved, uh, a lady, who could not feel the touch of earthly years, the ravages of life as we grow old, wrinkle, um, go through diseases, go through struggle. It seems that she could not feel the touch of earthly years, the touch of these ravages. So this is the literal meaning. Now let's dig a little deeper and see what the poet is trying to say here. So, a slumber did my spirit seal, I had no human fears, could either refer to the fact that we are so engrossed in our daily lives that we take um, disease and death for granted, that we do not really think about them till it strikes. And then there is the image juxtaposed, juxtaposition is placing two images together. So there is the image of the poet. Um, who is taking life as it goes by and there is the image of a girl who could not feel the touch of earthly earth. So she is kind of transcendental, she is kind of above all these things. Now, either it's a contrast that, that in living life day to day, I was not thinking about human fears 
and there is the image of this girl who cannot feel the touch of earthly years which means she is so beautiful or she is dead and which is why she cannot feel other way round if we look at the first two lines again um it could have a different meaning that because this girl is dead my spirit has been stolen by a slumber i cannot deal with this reality and because i have seen that first hand of a beloved i had no human fears so it can be taken either way a that i was taking life for granted and then suddenly i was jolted into this shock b that because somebody close died i had overcome all human fears regarding this so both explanations are valid as long as you logically argue for it also um falconry or hawking like that is that people used to have pet hawks or falcons and falconry was a favorite sport throughout um europe so they would have pet hawks they would train them and the hawks would go and hunt little squirrels or rabbits and so on and so forth and so what they would do because the hawk were wild and the falcons were wild they would blindfold these eyes of these hawks to tame them gradually and this was a part of the training so probably there's there's a reference in um sealing the spirit to falconry like our wild being our wilderness is is tamed um gradually as as we get trained as we get socialized into um, uh, life and so on and so forth and uh, so instead of i uh, the writer is using spirit so that's a very creative use of language to use spirit instead of i and so a sleep a kind of a other worldliness either it's daydreaming or it's real sleep so it can be metaphorical sleep or real sleep has stolen or sealed my spirit and in that state i have no human fears either because the writer is dealing with the death of a beloved and so he has overcome human fears because he has seen um the ultimate reality or that the writer had or this character had so far taken um human life and death for granted and suddenly this news has kind of made him aware Let's look at the next uh, stanza. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. Roll down in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. So this affirms the second stanza affirms that the beloved is definitely dead, and we see a negative use of language, a negative use of activity. no motion has she now there is no motion so passivity is being um introduced through a negative no motion no force she neither hears nor sees so with every um growing information in this poem we see that the passivity of of this girl and so through a negative use of language he in uh, reinforces the idea of death and so this idea is called tautology tautology is repetition repetition is used to great effect in uh, lots of poetry and music especially if you listen to sufi qawali um, uh, in india there's a lot of repetition of the same idea till so so that um, it becomes a chant it, so that you reach a trance like state and this is what the poet is trying to do over here uh, digging um in into the idea and drumming it into the reader's head that she has no motion no force she cannot hear she cannot see and then eventually the last two lines are very interesting that the first two lines of the poem as we saw earlier introduce um the writer whose spirit has been sealed the next four lines are about uh, the death of this girl the first two lines slowly we are not sure the next two lines very clearly and the last two lines of the poem are a sort of a redemption rolled around in earth's diurnal course diurnal is the longest um, 
polysyllabic word. Multiple syllables have been used in this uh, in, in this word in this poem. So the only word which is polysyllabic um, rolled around in Earth's diurnal course. So the Earth is revolving, and so is she along with uh, the rocks and stones and trees. So she has become part of the nature. She is no longer distinct from the nature, no longer a human being negotiating with nature, but she is part of the nature. And so, uh, even though it's a melancholic, sad poem with, with great pathos, but in the last two lines, we see that there is a sort of redemption, where um, um, a dead person becomes a part of the nature, so one is very much a part of one's um, mother, if uh, the earth taken as, as a metaphor for uh, mother. Um, also very interesting is the fact that the romantic poets primarily wrote uh, nature poetry. So it was a romance with nature. They replaced God with nature. And so it's a return to the God. Uh, and so this is a sort of nature worship um, as well. At once we um, uh, die, we return to the earth, we return to the five elements that we have come from. Okay, so let's look at the form and the structure uh, of this poem. The rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, as you can see. Force, course, seas, trees. And the first stanza, seal, feel, fears, ears. The two quatrains. So quatrain is um, any stanza that contains four lines, quat, four, and um, the lines alternate between iambic tetrameter and iambic trimeter. So these are slightly difficult concepts to understand, but um, um, I can try to make it simple, which is that there are eight syllables in the first line, six syllables in the next one, alternatingly. No motion, has she now, no force. So four, um, Four, four syllables which are voiced, four syllables which are not unvoiced. The second line is shorter, which is three meters. She neither hears nor sees. Right. Euphony, we have already discussed that the tone of um, the poem is um, sweet. Um, so the phonetics of it is sweet, despite the fact that it's talking about a very melancholy issue. In terms of the form of poem, what kind of poem it is, it's a nature poem because there's a return to the nature, there's a return uh, to with, with the rocks and stones and, and the earth's daily motion. It's a lyric poem, it's supposed um, to be sung, it's an elegy, elegies were poems written for the dead in their praise. It also um, fall, follows the form of a folk ballad. Um, which is um, the folk songs that were sung in the countryside of England. It also follows um, that form. So there's a lot packed into this eight lines, um, as um, you could see. Um, we've already seen all these things, but just to repeat, the spirit is switched for eyes, taken, taking the idea from falconry, and so there's a very creative use of seal. And so for all of you who are aspiring to be writers and poets, this is how creatively language is used. Even though you use simple words, you use metaphors which are not used generally. And so instead of closing of eyes, here Wordsworth talks about closing of um, the, the spirit. We already discussed tautology, how um, through no motion, no force, cannot hear, cannot see, and so on and so forth. The idea is drummed into the reader's head that this beautiful girl is, is dead. And um, then the uh, idea of passive act as redemption, that despite the fact that um, this girl would now be um, merely earthly remains rotating around with earth, but there is redemption in that, that we become one with nature from which we came. And the idea of nature as God as well. So here a little point that in um, uh, by 18th century um, uh, religions hold over Europe had um, become weaker and uh, primarily there was a lot of um, uh, corruption in the church and, and people had lots of difficulties and so in the new world the poets and the writers were looking for uh, 
replacement or rather replacement of the church not of god um, and so nature is it's in nature that, that they found great solace so that's one of the hallmarks of romantic poetry <coughs> so this is one of the five um, lucy poems um, one doesn't there's no clarity as to who um, um, lucy is but there are five of these uh, poems we do not have time to go into all of them um this was the melancholic time for the um, poet and this poem was written between 1798 and 1801 in goslar germany and as we have already seen it's a romantic poem now the general use of the word romantic is um in terms of um a romantic love between a man and a woman uh, or two people um but the idea of romantic poetry uh, historically is anything which has sublime emotions any idea which is slightly exaggerated um and there's a lot of eulogy for uh, uh, nature so it's romance for for nature for life itself so romantic should not be seen in the narrow sense of a person to person um, romance okay so a little bit about words with ideas um these ideas are from lyrical ballads which he co-authored with another great poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1798 where the idea is that Wordsworth says in lyrical ballads poetry should be written in the real language of men so as you have already seen with this poem the words are very simple there are no words that need explanation except uh, maybe slumber and diurnal and so this is a part of the poetic manifesto of Wordsworth that poetry should be accessible to all people should be able to capture their imagination another point that he makes is poetry is the spontaneous overflow of feelings it takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility so spontaneous is something that comes to you naturally um that you sitting at a place and a sudden flash of thought comes to you you sitting by a waterfall a sudden uh, flash of thought comes to you and and so on so forth and it takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility so you've been at the waterfall and then um you recollect your emotions from that tranquil time from that quiet time and sit down and write that poem so it's it's a very interesting idea of how um um naturally feelings flow to us and we write about them and that becomes poetry however this should be taken in its context and also with a pinch of salt because um you cannot just write anything and that will become poetry any thought that it has got a form it's got a structure as we saw and so first like you will be able to write something only if you know writing similarly you have to know poetry to be able to um uh, to write that way so once you're trained uh once you've read a lot of poetry once you understand the poetic form the poetic thought um and then you write uh with a spontaneous overflow then probably it it fits in otherwise people really confuse it um uh, for um writing anything that comes spontaneously so the counterpoint for example has been offered by t s eliot another great um, poet and essayist in tradition and individual talent um which was published in 1919 where he says that um, one has to be impersonal and detached while writing poetry one has to be objective one cannot be subjective so one cannot be mushy or over indulgent um, in writing poetry so these are some ideas of wordsworth and t s eliot about uh, poetry so let us move to the next um, um, song that we have um, here which is by shakespeare and it's called fear no more william shakespeare one of the greatest uh, playwrights that the world has ever known and the greatest playwright in um, english language lived between 1564 and 1616 um the elizabethan age when queen elizabeth was the ruler let us have a look at the poem so in your um, book only three stanzas of the four have been included but we'll cover all four over here um to get a holistic view and of course we'll go through all all the stanzas fear no more the heat of the sun nor the furious winter's rages thou thy worldly task had done home art gone and taken thy wages 
Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers come to dust. Fear no more the frown of the great, thou art past the tyrant's stroke. Care no more to clothe and eat, to thee the reed is as the oak. The scepter, learning, psychic must, all follow this and come to dust. Fear no more the lightning flash, nor the all-dreaded thunderstone. Fear not slander, censure rash, thou hast finished joy and moan. All lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. No exorciser harm thee, nor no witchcraft charm thee, ghost unlaid forbear thee, nothing ill come near thee, quiet consummation have, and renowned be thy grave. Okay, so that is the poem. And now let us look at it line by line. It's, it's fairly easy. Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. So do not fear the harsh heat of the sun, and do not fear the furious winter's rages. So here winter is personified as a furious man raging and foaming. Um, and so there is a harsh summer and a harsh winter. So winter is personified as I said. So fear not the summer, fear not the winter, winter's harshness. Thou thy worldly task had done, Home art gone and taken thy wages. So here death is referred to as daily labor and return home. So the metaphor is that we've been sent by um, the forces of nature, by God to this world to do our work and then take our wages, um, reap the fruits of our uh, labor, earn good karma, earn um, goodwill and return back to where we came from, from the nature and from God. So do not fear the heat of the sun, do not fear the winter, do not fear the nature's ravages. You have done your worldly task and now it's time to go home after taking your wages, after taking your good karma. Golden lads and girls all must as chimney sweepers come to dust. So golden lads and girls um, is referring to young boys and girls, lad is for um, boys, um, with golden hair, with, with blonde hair as you would find in England. Um, or it's just referring to very healthy young um, girls and boys. They all must as chimney sweepers. So this reference is very interesting, chimney sweepers, which you will see in um, um, a, a lot of uh, romantic uh, poetry um, also uh, later on. Chimney sweepers were little boys who were employed to clean the chimneys of houses. So there would be a house and uh, the system was to cook with fire so there would be a chimney and the chimney would get clogged with all the carbon. And so somebody had to go inside the chimney to clean it up. And who would that be done by? You, you needed somebody slender, somebody small. And so it would be um, boys. So today what is uh, what we clearly know in, as child labor was not so in um, uh, up till 19th century England. Anybody who was seven years and above was considered an adult. So it's been a lot of struggle in forming labor laws, in, uh, in forming laws about who's a child, who's an adolescent, who's a juvenile and who's an adult. So here now we have, so it's not natural laws. It's taken a lot of time for the world to um, understand these things. And so these, these boys who would clean up the chimneys, seven, eight year old boys, um, of course would die because uh, they're very young, um, they do not have the capacity to do this job and they would fall sick because of um, inhalation in their lungs of, of all the dust and they'd die in a few years. And so this is a strange contrast that golden lads and girls, the rich boys and girls from uh, well-to-do families as well as these poor lads, chimney sweepers, both uh, will eventually die. And so his, um, Shakespeare is saying that death is a leveler. So we see that clearly the stanza is divided into three parts, which we'll see in the remaining stanzas also, that there's a recurrence of this idea. The first two lines are about nature, that there's nature's harshness, which we have to deal with. Secondly, there's worldly work that we do. 
uh, which we have to deal with. And thirdly, the inevitability of death, that everybody has to die, whether they are golden or whether they are chimney sweepers. And the same pattern we'll see would be repeated in the next stanza. Fear no more the frown of the great, thou art past the tyrant's stroke. So frown of the great. So great leaders, kings who frown upon you. So if they're displeased with you, um, they can harm you. And this uh, routinely happened. Uh, you would have read many kings and tyrants and dictators' stories that they, if they are displeased with, displeased with anyone, you would, um, you'd, you'd be in for a tough time. You could get a, a death punishment. Um, thou art part the, past the tyrant's stroke. So tyrant is, is somebody who deals uh, rules with an iron hand and also does not really care for um, human values. And so the same idea is repeated, the frown of the great and the tyrant's stroke. The tyrant's stroke is probably the stroke of a sword. Um, so when you're living under a ruler who's um, despotic, your life is really um, under trouble. Um, you have to think what you um, say and freedom of expression is curtailed, as was in all of medieval um, uh, Europe and England. So you should not fear um, the despotic ruler's uh, wrath, anger, stroke. Care no more to clothe and eat, to thee the reed is as the oak. So you should not be bothered about how you will clothe yourself, how you will eat. Um, to you, the reed, reed is a grass reed, a thin reed, and oak is an oak tree which is really thick with a lot of um, girth, uh, a lot of weight. And so to a dead person, whether it's a grass or thick wood, it does not matter. It matters to the uh, living people. The scepter, learning, physic must all follow this and come to dust. So here... This is called cynic doke, where one part of something represents the whole. So scepter is, is a wand that um, the kings used to carry as a symbol of authority. So scepter represents the king over here. Learning represents teacher or a scholar. Physic is a doctor. And so the king, the scholar, the doctor, all must follow these rules. That at some point of time, to them, the reed and the oak will become the same and they will not need to worry about clothing and eating. So once again, the same pattern. The first two lines um, are deal with one subject, the tyrant stroke. And this, the second part um, deals with our negotiation, our struggles with nature. And the third part, the inevit inevitability of death once again. Third stanza. Fear no more the lightning flash nor the all dreaded thunderstorm. So do not fear the wrath of nature again. When lightning strikes, people hide, animals hide. Do not fear that. Do not fear the thunderstorm. Do not fear the thunderstorm that accompanies with light. So first part again is nature. The second two lines, fear not slander, sense your rash. So do not fear uh, the slander, the abuses, that the society gives you or it censures you, censure is, is chastising you, scolding you, uh, punishing you for um, uh, what the society thinks is, is wrong or what people around you think is wrong. So rash censures, slander, abuses, do not fear these things. Thou hast finished joy and mourn. So the, the time for joyfulness and mourning uh, for, for both happiness and sadness is over in, in death. All lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. So we have seen in the previous two um, slides the categories of scepter, king, learning, teacher, physic, doctor. And before that, children, rich, children, poor. And here, the lovers. That the lovers' uh, image, as you see in films or songs, is eternal. It seems that the lovers would live on forever. But lovers also uh, must consign to thee must also consign to you, must also go back to you and come to dust. So once again we see the same pattern. Nature, struggle with the world and the inevitability of death. 
The fourth stanza is different. It is a volta. Volta is um, the other term that you've heard in this regard is volta phase, which is a reversal, a turnaround. So the first three stanzas deal with death, that you deal with nature, with the world, but death will bring you relief and everybody must return to uh, the earth. After the return to earth has happened, this stanza is about that. No exorciser harm thee, nor no witchcraft charm thee, ghost unlaid forbear thee, nothing ill come near thee, quiet consumption have, and renowned be thy grave. So exorciser is somebody who summons spirits. If you've seen ghost movies, um, um, you'd see that there's an exorcist who summons um, spirits who take spirits out of ghosts and, and deals with the problem. So hopefully nobody, no exorciser will come to take away your spirit. Nor no witchcraft charm thee. So witchcraft also is, is um, summoning uh, the spirits. Of course it's a loaded term because um, there's also witch hunting associated with it. Lots of um, girls and women were um, accused of being witches who consorted with the devil and therefore they were um, uh, punished, killed, um, burnt, um, hanged and so on and so forth in, in medieval Europe, medieval America as well. One of the most um, horrendous um, uh, memories of this in history is the Salem witch hunt of 1492 where um, several girls, 30 odd girls, were accused of consorting with the devil, having pact with the devil um, in America and uh, they were all hanged publicly. And uh, so the word witch is always loaded but we should take it, um, uh, we should understand the historical context of it. But anyway. Um, so once you are in grave, let no exorciser take away your spirit, nor um, any witchcraft. Nobody comes and does magic on your dead body, on your spirit, and takes it away that it lies in peace. Ghost unlaid, um, <clears throat> forbear thee. So uh, the idea in this line is that people who do not get a proper burial, um, um, their ghosts would roam about because they have not been put to rest. So people who have not been buried properly roam, roaming around as ghosts, those ghosts do not come and disturb you while you are sleeping in your death. Nothing ill come near thee. So these are the dangers for a dead person, an exorciser, um, a witchcraft and ghosts coming and disturbing them. So quiet consummation have. That you are now mingled with the earth. Consummation is generally used as a term for um, um, a, a post-marriage term that the wife and husband become one. And so that same metaphor is used that the person and the earth have become one. That you have been consumed. Both have consumed each other. And renowned be thy grave. That people remember you. Um, through uh, people come and pay respect to your grave for the memory of the good deeds um, that you have done. So that is roughly what Shakespeare wants to say. So he's saying that despite nature's ravages, despite what the world has to give you, in death there will be some sort of redemption and one, one should not fear it because it is, after all, inevitable. So um, we've seen this, but just to reiterate, nature's ravages and vicissitudes. Vicissitudes is a change of circumstances, worldly cares of daily lives, and the inevitability of death. These, this is the scheme in which the poem is largely divided. So also juxtapositioning of the extremes. Juxtapositioning is placing two things um, side by side. So heat of the sun and winter's rage. Extreme summer, extreme winter. Golden lads versus chimney sweepers. Very rich, very poor. Uh, we also saw the idea of cynic doke, scepter, learning, physic, where a part represents the whole. And we saw the idea of volta, of a turnaround in the last stanza, where the first three stanzas keep a certain tone, and the last stanza is the hope that nobody um, disturbs the departed spirit. And uh, so this song of Shakespeare is taken from his play called Cymbeline. 1611 was the first production um, of this um, play and uh, this is the scene where the person is dead and, and this song appears. So Shakespeare's oeuvre, um, his repertoire, his work, um, Peter Seng 
um, has collected 70 songs of Shakespeare. So Shakespeare does not write songs separately, they are embedded in his plays. Um, he also wrote beautiful sonnets, there are 154 of them. He's best known for his plays. There are 39 of them, at least 39 are extant, 39 we know of. And now um, this song um, um, rendered. Beautiful rendition, isn't it? Um, so these are the credits. This is from the graduate recital of New York University and sung by H. Uh, Lamont Watson. The composition is by Roger Quilter. Um, interestingly, there are poets from Shakespeare's time, John Donne, James Shirley, 1572 um, to 1631, John Donne, and James Shirley, 1596 to 1666, who also wrote um, uh, equally stirring and important poems about death, almost with the same tone, with the same um, matter. So uh, John Donne is one of the most uh, famous metaphysical poets. Uh, he wrote a poem called Death Be Not Proud. We are not going into it. But let's look at James Shirley, who's around the same time, 1596 to 1666. Now, what is um, the matter here? Why are there three poets of the same time writing uh, about death and so engaged um, uh, with this idea. Poets of all generations have done this, but we see a multiplicity in this time. It is because England was struck by plague many, many times, very much like the COVID crisis in the world right now and people preoccupied with the idea of death and gloom and melancholia. Um, Plague struck London again and again after a few years' interval during this time. So much so that in 1592-93, all the theatres were shut down, very much like now. So Shakespeare lived in a time when theatres did shut down for a while and there was real fear of plague. So you'd see the reference to plague in several of his um, plays. Um, and yet he was a very successful um, uh, playwright of his time. Um, and so um, this crisis of um, coronavirus is, is 
is novel, is new and, and very dangerous. But at the same time, history has dealt with um, ep epidemics and pandemics um, several times and come out of it the better, with better learning, um, with better hope. James Shirley's poem, we'll quickly go through. It's called Death the Leveler. I wouldn't go into the explanation. Consider it self-explanatory because it's not a part of your syllabus, but it's, it's a very good poem to refer to. Death the Leveler. The glories of our blood and state are shadows, not substantial things. There is no armor against fate. Death lays his icy hand on kings. Scepter and crown must tumble down and in dust be equal made with the poor crooked scythe and spade. So once again you see that the same ideas of scepter and crown must tumble down. The same words have almost been used like Shakespeare. Must and be uh, in dust be equal made. So must in dust that we all must return to dust is the idea and that no, um, no king shall be able to um, stall this. Some men with swords may reap the field and plant fresh laurels where they kill, but their strong nerves at last must yield. They tame but one another still. Early or late they stoop to fate and must give up their murmuring breath when they, pale captives, creep to death. Uh, once again over here, all the warriors, all the brave men, they also will fall early or late. The garlands wither on your brow, then boast no more your mighty deeds. Upon death's purple altar now, see where the victor, victim bleeds. Your heads must come to the cold tomb. Only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in their dust. The same idea again. Um, that both the victor and victim will go back um, and all heads must go to the tomb. And like Shakespeare says in the last line over there, may your name uh, on the grave shine. And similarly here, James Shirley says that only the actions of the just people um, will blossom in their dust. Um, now a rendition of um, this poem, it's quite interesting, animated, and I'll leave you um, with that to end this lesson. The glories of our blood and state are shadows, not substantial things. There is no armor against fate. Death lays his icy hand on kings. Scepter and crown must tumble down and in the dust be equal made with the poor crooked scythe and spade. Some men with swords may reap the field and plant fresh laurels where they kill. But their strong nerves at last must yield. They tame but one another still. Early or late, they stoop to fate and must give up the murmuring breath when they, pale captives, creep to death. The garlands wither on your brow. Then boast no more your mighty deeds. Upon death's purple altar now, See where the victor, victim, bleeds. Your heads must come to the cold tomb. Only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in their dust. Well, thanks a lot and hope to see you with another literary piece soon. <laughs>